normally menstruating women who weren't taking oral contraceptives and women taking oral contraceptives. And I just measured their baseline hormone levels at certain points through the female's um, menstrual cycle. And I found it very interesting that the men had higher endogenous or natural estrogen levels over the women taking oral contraceptives. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. This is the first interview episode of 2016 and hopefully last week you enjoyed the uh, recap episode of what we, what we have coming in this year and kind of what I've been up to a little bit more as some of you have asked about that. Um, now today I have a, it's kind of a female based episode, although I do think a lot of males will be able to resonate with what uh, my guests and I talk about, uh, particularly when it comes to comparison. So today I'm talking to Sarah Joyce, who is a sports scientist with specialised knowledge of the female athlete. And we also kind of dive deep today into the scientific research and what she found about gender differences the effects of female sex hormones on muscle damage and recovery. But actually, interestingly, we actually didn't talk about this as much as I thought we would. We kind of ended up going off on a bit of a tangent. Um, But actually, I think you might find it kind of enjoyable because we talked about the um, comparison trap and uh, weight gain and how, you know, this time of year we tend to be very critical of ourselves because we may have indulged a little over the winter holidays or whatever it may be and uh, the comparison trap can really get us in trouble. So I really think a lot of people will be able to enjoy this episode and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Uh, Sarah is also an established writer and is the editor-in-chief of Women's Running Running Magazine Australia, so you will have other ways to keep in touch with her after this episode. So without further ado, let's go meet Sarah. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Sarah. Thank you, Tina. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be talking to you right now. Um, So let's start with you, as I want to kind of dive quite deep into the topics today, but just so anyone listening has a few moments to acclimatise or, you know, if you're you're getting anything done right now, get it finished because you're probably going to want to listen to this. Um, So while we're, before we dive into that deep stuff, let's learn a little more about you. So I just wanted you to give us some kind of, something from your history, maybe a short summary of your running life, or if there was a moment you remember in specific where you fell in love with running, or just something about you to let our listeners know. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I took up running when I was aged 18 years of age, Um, so quite a while ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like to reveal my age, but anyway. (laughs) Um, but as a child, my mum and dad were both recreational runners, so I have memories of being involved in running and going to running events, but yeah, it wasn't really until I was 18 that I uh, took it up. Um, I was involved in netball and basketball as a teenager, and Mm -hmm. I was quite good at those, but really not that athletically gifted, which I think is why I really liked running because it wasn't competitive. I could just do it. Really, the only competitor was myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I guess like most recreational running runners, it's just a lifestyle for me now. So it's just part of my life. Most of my friends are runners. Uh, I've been to some amazing places through running. I met my partner through running. Uh, so, yeah, it's really just... Um, my lifestyle and now I'm lucky enough to work um in running as well so I find that quite lucky as yeah. well yeah, that's great, and thank you for sharing that. And it's it's interesting that you mentioned that this that was the only like you said the only sport you felt like you could do. But I think um, although you said that you're the only competitor, and I think a lot of people agree with that that it's nice that you're not fighting for a spot or you're not competing, you know, against uh, trying to outbeat others at any cost you're just it's you for the most part anyway if we can get it right although sometimes that's tough (laughs) and when did your passion for like working with female athletes come through like was there a moment you remember probably at university I mean if you talk to my family they've probably also been a feminist for most of my life (laughs) 
For as long as I can remember, I have admired female athletes. Uh, but when I was at university, I, I guess my understanding of the differences between males and females developed. And one thing I noticed, I look back now at my university textbooks, is in each physiology textbook, there was two to three pages dedicated to the female athlete. Yeah. And that was within a special issues chapter and all the rest was just general. And, you know, really, in my opinion, half the book should be dedicated to males and mm-hmm. half the book should be dedicated to females. So, you know, seeing just two to three pages about women, I sort of thought, oh, that's not right. And then my my understanding developed about the differences between men and women and I guess that's where my passion came from. Yeah, and then, so you just mentioned that about, um, you know, a few pages and how you think it should be half and half. Di- so it's in your research it's been that different that, you know, you would split up for the most part? Like you found that many differences between males and females? Yeah, yeah, really? definitely. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of difference. And my research was based on endocrinology, so mm-hmm. looking at the mm-hmm. effects of female sex hormones. Um, and we know that there's big differences and they do affect the way that women respond to exercise and training. Wow, yeah. Okay, well, let's dive into those a little bit more. And um, so I've noticed, I don't know if it's just because it's that awareness thing, but I've noticed there seems to be kind of more focus coming in in recent years. Um, Do you feel like people are starting to pay more attention to it or do you feel that this is very much still brushed under the carpet? Uh, Yes, certainly. I do think people are paying more attention to it and also in areas outside of exercise physiology, which Mm -hmm. is my area. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in the areas of medicine and pharmacology now, they're realising that generally we've just treated males and females the same and in terms of their responses to drugs um, or treatments, women are quite different. They require different doses and respond differently to the drugs. So even outside of the realm of exercise physiology, um, I think people are taking notice. But within the sports science field, definitely. Um, And I guess outside of science, if you're looking anecdotally at coaches, they definitely work with female athletes differently and treat them differently to how they do males in terms of training response. Absolutely. And my uh, husband is a, a, a coach for men and women, but I definitely see the difference between, well, you know, I guess myself as well, how he, t- how he coaches the women and the men. It, it is uh, definitely uh, mentally there. We require different <laughs> treatment as well. And do you have a theory on why up to this point, it's been mostly ignored the women's issues or women's differences? I I guess I have a personal theory. I don't know how correct it is. We'd love to hear it. <laughs> I've, from all the sports science literature I've read, and I've read it quite a bit um, mm-hmm. through my scientific career, is I think women have been ignored generally because it's just too hard. Um, but it, it's... And, and I know from my own experience in my own studies, it is very hard to control, particularly the menstrual cycle and hormonal fluctuations. And, you know, I had to make a big effort in my data collection phase to control for that. So most of the studies that you do read, it's just... It, it's hard, too hard to control for it. So they um, either exclude women altogether or they take women who are taking oral, oral contraceptives because then they're on a balanced sort of hormonal level. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. So I think generally, yeah, we're just too difficult, so we're excluded. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're kind of known for doing that, aren't we, being the ones that um, <laughs> cause all the trouble, happy wife, happy life kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and when it comes to your, like, findings, you said you've done a lot of research, and I'm really excited to hear about what you've found. Um, can you share some of the most significant findings that you've had with uh, females and female running? Yeah, sure. So I guess the most novel finding that I find quite interesting and as a a PhD candidate and looking at my data, I found this really exciting. And like I said, it is quite novel, but in my study, I took three groups. So I had men um, and I had normally menstruating women who weren't taking oral contraceptives and women taking oral contraceptives. And I just measured their baseline hormone levels at certain points through the female's um, menstrual cycle. And I found it very interesting that the men had higher endogenous or natural estrogen levels over the women taking oral contraceptives. And um, I think the men were quite surprised that, you know, 
I've got more oyster than probably half the women on the campus. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that that was one of the probably the novel findings yeah. that I found that was interesting. And what like did did you have any theories as to why that was? That's I mean that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's um, pretty straightforward. So women taking oral contraceptives take a synthetic estrogen and that suppresses their natural estrogen, which is yeah. how the oral contraceptives work. So essentially they can't get pregnant. Um, so that that's what it's designed to do. Mm-hmm. But, I, yeah, I never thought that their levels would be lower than what a male's would be. <laughs> I bet that shuts some of the males up yeah, in the study. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to any males listening who are um, who are – kind of understanding of this but uh, and what else did you find that was kind of interesting that people might like to learn about yeah so uh, my personal interest is in endurance performance I guess and training Mm -hmm. and I looked very closely at muscle damage and recovery so what happens when you damage a muscle extensively and then how quickly it recovers and really interestingly there was big differences we already knew there was differences between men and women but there was big differences between the women taking oral contraceptives and the normally menstruating women so i mentioned that the males had higher estrogen levels than the girls taking oral contraceptives and the girls taking oral contraceptives they responded more like men to the damaging exercise okay and is that was that a good thing or was that well (laughs) that's that's sort of the, where my study ended so okay. I mean there's so much more you could do you asked if uh if people are more interested in this now and I'd love to see more people doing training studies and looking at the effects mm-hmm. of yeah this muscle damage and recovery okay and then uh so do you plan on going into that a bit more in the future uh, I would really like to but I've sort of stepped out of academia now and okay. um yeah so it would it's difficult to get back into it but uh yeah I, I mean if I had the opportunity I'd love to be involved in more, more of that research okay so any any uh researchers or people who have the resources to do that that's some an idea for you to yeah. to get going on so then you said that you've kind of stepped out of it uh this is probably a good time to kind of share what you are doing now when it comes to this because I'm sure even though you're not researching it, it's, it's very much in the forefront of your mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I, um, when I finished my PhD, I started editing uh, Women's Running Australia. So yep. it's a, Australia's only uh, women's running magazine. So I, I'm still using my knowledge on the female athlete, but talking more, I guess, to re- recreational runners uh, through, through the magazine. Mm-hmm. And what have you kind of found? Uh, is there anything you've kind of noticed with w- women runners? I mean, I'm thinking kind of, uh, emotional, um, emotional factors as a scientist, I'm sure you loved, uh, you know, the facts and the research, but what have you found about emotions? I'm sure that comes into it a lot more with, you know, like you said, working with women, uh, more on a one-to-one than a study. Yeah, well, actually going back to my research study, one profound thing I noticed was between males and females was the the protocol that my subjects had to go through was pretty intense and their commitment to the research was pretty high. So the damage protocol, I mean, I wouldn't like to do it myself. It It was pretty extreme damage. So imagine how you feel after a marathon doubled it was yeah oh, wow. really bad plus they had to undergo a lot of repeat blood samples and the women just took it like a grain of salt though they, they just <laughs> but the men <laughs> sorry to the males that, that that are listening but they were a little bit more sensitive and yeah had issues with I had to listen to a lot of complaining from the men where the women just sort of they were hardcore essentially <laughs> that's funny because we get the reputation for being a uh being the complaining ones and actually that's funny you mentioned that um yesterday my chiropractor was talking about how um usually the women handle the pain when he does active release handle the pain a bit better um and uh he said he thought a lot of it was because the men come in thinking oh this is not going to be bad and then it's like worse than they uh it's worse than they think and the women come in thinking oh this is going to hurt so much and then it's a little bit easier so I wonder if it's the same and just out of curiosity you said you like at the end of a marathon doubled how did you do that um so the damage protocol we used was we did eccentric contractions so Mm -hmm. lengthening contractions of the Mm -hmm. quadricep muscle which is known to cause the greatest damage Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking back now but they did 240 slow eccentric contractions on each quad and that was broken down into sets of 10 
Um, but overall, the prot- protocol took about three hours. So, you know, the length of a marathon, but it was the slow damage. It was, yeah, it was designed to cause extreme damage and mm. it certainly did. When you saw these people 24 and 48 hours after. Um, <laughs> Limping <yeah>. around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And plus then I was getting all these, taking all this blood from them. And so, yeah, I, I have to thank my subjects. They, they were real troopers. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, and I wonder if they would sign up with it for a uh, another study with you in the future. If yeah. They'd be like, no, 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 please. Yeah. I don't want to do this. It's not worth it. Well, I guarantee that, that the men definitely wouldn't. The girls would probably <laughs> pass up again. <laughs> well, hopefully in the future you can get that going and we'll see if any of the same people apply. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then what else have you kind of been enjoying with with wi- women's running australia um I, I really enjoy being involved in recreational female female running and it's i think it's it's a real boom in australia at the moment that we're mm-hmm. seeing more and more women are taking up running and back to the beginning of our conversation where i said it's not competitive i think that's what women are finding that they really like about it uh, and it's easy to do but now if you look at you know a lot of the the proportion of running races you know females used to sort of make up 10 or 12% of competitors uh, where you know where they're 50% of them now in most mm-hmm. events. So, yeah, so it's great. Just more and more women taking part. Yeah, no, I, I've definitely noticed a bit of a switch and it, it's it's great to see. And actually, I just took my honeymoon to Australia and uh, we were surprised with, well, not just women, but the amount of people out there running and active. And it seems in Australia, you've got it, you know, obviously you've got the nice weather and, uh, yeah. you know, that helps a lot and the beaches, but um, it's, it just seems like people are a lot more active. There's a lot of cycling, people cycle everywhere. And I kind of hope some of the other um, cultures of the world kind of follow along with yes, that definitely. in the yeah. future. And- and I guess what goes with that is people are trying to be active and healthy and then their their want for knowledge and information about training and being healthy and how do they get better goes along with that. So that's where Women's Running Australia can assist. Mm-hmm. And where do you see Women's Running Australia kind of headed? What direction do you see them going in for the future or are you going in? Uh, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, yeah, I mean. Just keep progressing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've got plans for immediate plans and long-term plans. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, just getting bigger and bigger, I hope, and more more people are reading and picking up the magazine and more women taking up running. Like I said, it's growing, but I'd like to see that trend continuing. Mm-hmm. And um, I heard in another interview that you um, only – you do not use models for your cover images. You only use like real runners. So I just wanted you to kind of explain that a little more for listeners because, you know, we're starting to see that a little bit over here. I think women's running America was the first one to do that, but um, it'd be nice if more of them did. So if you, if you had a few things you wanted to share about the magazine that they're doing, that's good that people could check out online. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, it's funny that you mentioned that because just today I received our latest issue. Uh, every year we run a front cover competition where our readers actually submit photos to go on the cover. Oh, cool. uh, and we started that a few years ago and that was really nice because it's just one of our readers, their photo is on the cover. So it's, it, I think women really relate to that. Uh, but we have previously used models, but I've been publishing the magazine for two years now uh and since then yeah we've just gone away from that and most of the sort of everyday women that we do put on the cover they have a really interesting story behind why they started running or what they've achieved uh so it's nice to feature them and get get a little bit of exposure for what they do because there's some amazing women out there I mean Mm -hmm. when you read what they do and what they achieve it just um yeah it really blows me away Mm -hmm. absolutely and that's something I want to focus on more this year in the podcast is uh kind of reading behind the some of the runners out there because you're absolutely right um I mean every runner has their own story of how it began and and it is fascinating to hear about them so it's great that you're you know taking the time to feature people like that and I'm guessing all those people that applied you got to read their stories and you know um you probably did you have like a finalist kind of thing that you could you were checking out some of them or was it all made within your like you kind of all decided under the table and then kind of revealed the winner yeah so okay. uh, yeah it, 
only my editorial team up until today okay. um, has known the, who the winner is and I'm not sure if she even knows yet. So mm. that's quite exciting. Mm. Uh, but subscribers will start receiving their copies today and tomorrow. Oh, cool. That's and that'll great. That'll be discovered, yeah. But uh, so that's, I mean, our front cover competition. But other covers we've taken, you know, just an everyday woman from an event. Um, so she's running an event and we've taken her actual event photo and used that. Great. Uh, yeah, as opposed to doing sort of stuff a stage shoot as such okay and then so what if you if we think about beginner runners or people who like you mentioned have just taken it up and stuff do you have what advice do you have based on your experience based on women's running and your um research on women starting who may have become a little disheartened with running or felt like just having a bit of a struggle right now Mm. Mm. um Take it slow is the main thing and and definitely enjoy the little milestones and achievements because the more you run and the better you get those achievements or your improvements become less and less. So enjoy those while you have them early on. But the other thing I think is not comparing yourself to other people. So it sort of is your own journey. Uh, You can't really look at other people's race times or what training they're doing uh you you know just like I said before compete against yourself or even looking at other people's body composition you know just just think about yourself and it's your own journey uh I think I always think like if I compared myself to a runner like you Tina I would be constantly disheartened so (laughs) it's really it's really just about your own journey you can't look at what other people were doing I mean you can draw on them from inspiration and advice but yeah yeah that's my biggest thing is just just try not compare yourself to other people absolutely and I think that's something critical that it's so difficult with this social media world we live in where you know most people only post the positive that's coming and you know I feel so great and then you know say you'd had a bad day or bad run you think oh, well, everyone around me is running so well and I'm struggling, especially if it's, you know, a few days or a few weeks in a row, which which happens, mm-hmm. or if you have an injury. And uh, I, I just want to say right now, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's not just like you saying it right there. It's not just brand new runners. Um, I know I really struggle with it sometimes, um, actually quite a lot of the time. And, and if you are listening and you do kind of struggle with that, well, do your best to take that away from you. Like I... I I force myself not to look at some um, social media accounts that make mm-hmm. me feel bad about myself. So mm-hmm. do the same thing. Like like you said, draw inspiration from people. But the comparison thing, if if there's someone that you notice when you go on their site makes you feel bad about yourself, just try hard. And I know it's easy yeah. to say, try hard not to look at that and look for the sources of inspiration. So yeah. I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that. And actually on that point, the other thing I notice a lot of is a lot of people are giving other people advice, which is great, but it might not what they're doing might not be right for you and what they're doing, they might not even explain why they're doing that. They might not even know why they're doing mm-hmm. that. So having an understanding of the sort of training that you're doing can help yourself. Uh, yeah, so be cautious of at even looking at what other people are doing, um, yeah. I, I think for sure. Absolutely. And and based on what you have kind of said, women's running, you know, strives to be one of those places where you can get the actual information and, you know, you've researched it with people like you behind it. You've actually got the research. And uh, I know that's something we pride ourselves on at Runners Connect is not having the fluff. Um, so I will put links to the show in the show notes just for anyone new listening um, for our website, um, our blog posts, and uh, for women's running. And I'll mention that right now, which is runnersconnect.net forward slash RC89. Okay, so I just want to kind of dive in a little bit deeper um, just with some of your experience of what you have found when it comes to women, Um, just some advice for women or if someone's struggling with, uh, you know, they've started with a male and the male is kind of taking off ahead of them and, Um, it can be frustrating so just come some findings or pieces of advice you would give for women based on what you have found uh I think it just goes back to taking it slow and not Mm -hmm. comparing yourself um particularly the boys um but you'll often find if a male can beat you over 10k do the training and challenge him to a longer event because that's where women tend to let excel um Mm -hmm slow and steady wins wins the race which um is definitely true when it comes to female endurance athletes uh yeah but again i 
I wouldn't even bother comparing myself to anyone else, but let alone a male. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Okay. And then yeah. what about recovery based on your experience? I know you said you didn't have the science behind it, but I'm guessing after that study, it kind of piqued your interest that you wanted to look into it a little bit more of what mm-hmm. others had found. Mm-hmm. Um, recovery is a big issue. And I, I think a lot of new runners, they, they get the running bug and they don't want to stop running and that often leads to leads to a lot of overuse injuries. But, I mean, generally from my studies you can say, well, women can train a lot harder uh, and back up. So repeated days, they don't need as much recovery as um, men in general. But in saying that, I think, yeah, people do need to be cautious to include recovery in their training program, uh, they schedule it in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a big thing that's missing from a lot of recreational runners programs that I see. Yeah, and we've we've actually found the same thing, and we've done multiple articles, um, and there'll be some links in the show notes to them again um, about easy running and how most runners uh, do not give themselves enough easy days. Everything ends up being you know moderate, which is crucial to recovery and helps in so many ways. Even though it's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around how running slow mm-hmm. helps us, but um, yeah. Yeah, that, so that's that's good that you found that, and uh, interesting that the women kind of in general recovered a bit quicker than the men. Um, and then, what about when it comes to nutrition? Have you found anything about um, females, and you know, a big difference when it comes to nutrition for running? Yeah, I, I'm not a dietitian, so mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, 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 mm-hmm. I, you know, I also like to leave that to the experts. Um, but women do have, I guess specific nutrition needs compared to men um, but generally I I don't deal with elite runners um, and obviously when you look at them having a low body weight is is crucial but in terms of recreational runners I just think balance is the key so you know avoid these restriction diets uh, where food groups are omitted or calorie calories are restricted um basically i think if a diet's hard to maintain um or you have to force yourself to do it you probably shouldn't be doing it mm-hmm. uh personally i'm quite lucky because i enjoy healthy food uh so eating healthy is quite easy for me but at the same time i'm a massive chocoholic um, <laughs> but i allow myself to have that and you know i guess that's another reason why i run uh but yeah, it really comes back to balance. Um, I think for most for most people, and if you do get that balance, each individual might have some specific dietary needs um, that are personalised. But generally, um, you know, if you get that balance right, it, it, you shouldn't have too much need to to go over and beyond that. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, that's that links very well with uh, one of our last episode of 2015, which we interviewed um, Katie Foster from uh, the website Runs for Cookies, and she lost over 125 pounds and uh, through running and changing her diet. And one, the biggest thing she said was, "Only make changes that you can keep for life." And mm-hmm. she said that was what did it for her. You know, going on a yo-yo diet or saying, "I want to lose this quickly," but she made changes that she knew she could keep. And I think that is exactly what you just said right there, that mm-hmm. like that doesn't have to be, like you said, you're a chocoholic and uh, mm-hmm. I definitely have my sweet teeth mm-hmm. and so does Katie. Like, But other people it may be, you know, something savoury or um, salty or whatever, but you don't have to completely eliminate that. It's just making changes that you can keep and like you mentioned, yeah. You know, not not a fad diet or not a mm-hmm. um, restriction because you can't keep it up. So that's that's good that you mentioned that. And I'll put a link mm-hmm. to her interview in the show notes. And then what about yeah. when it comes to body fat? Uh, um, is there um, a certain percentage that you've found you wouldn't recommend women get below? Or um, do you have any thoughts on that compared to men? Yeah. Look, like I said before, for elite runners or someone trying to qualify for a national team or something like that there's no denying that a low body weight is going to be beneficial to their performance but they need to do that without compromising their health obviously and Mm -hmm. and they're people who need uh, specific dietary um advice you know from a professional but when it comes to recreational runners which is mostly what I deal with I think they really shouldn't worry too much about body fat percentage because you know they're not trying to to qualify for anything or uh, win a race, most of them. And I think as long as they're within a healthy weight range, because we do know that 
um, being overweight and obese isn't good for our health. So as long as you're in a healthy weight range and they're happy, it's all that really matters. Mm -hmm. And have you found BMI is uh, enough and it's not the most accurate indicator, but it's very easy. Have you found that when you say a healthy weight, fight, staying within mm-hmm. that range is good enough? Um, uh, yeah, that and hip to weight ratio. Okay. Um, I think using those combined, and and if you're concerned that you might be outside of a, what's considered a healthy um, weight, um, you, you know, it doesn't hurt to see a professional and get some advice to really look at that, but. I think most female runners, um, you know, it's not something they really sh- should should be focusing on or worried about. Okay. And then the hip to weight ratio, um, I'll get you to send me some kind of link to uh, how people can calculate that as I'm guessing it, there's some kind of online calculator that people yeah, can yeah. use. Yeah, it's a simple measurement of comparing um, your hip to waist um, ratio. So essentially it, it's saying that the more weight you carry around the, your middle it's more it's not good for your health um so the, the bigger your ratio the better and have you found that's uh more applicable with women than men or is it about the same like uh, it's about the same but yeah it is a good it's a good measure for women and men too so yeah but i can certainly send you some information on okay. that great all right i'll put that in the show notes and then what about <laughs> um a different kind of fat have you have you found in any way that uh women should eat more fat than men I mean that's something I've kind of heard in recent years and I know again you're not a nutritionist so you're going to be wary about saying this but have you found anything in your research yeah no you, it's certainly true that I'm wary about what I say uh, <laughs> but I do have a very good understanding of the metabolic differences between men and women and what fuels they utilize when they are exercising and one of the effects of high levels of each estrogen is women is we do utilize fat a lot better um, and conserve our glycogen source, which is advantageous for endurance uh, mm-hmm. events. It's mm-hmm. a good thing. Um, but for that reason, sort of our need for carbohydrates and sugars is probably less uh, lower than what men's are. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, but that's from a performance perspective, not so much looking at health, um, which mm-hmm. is probably what you're alluding to in that question, I um, think. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it, it could be either or. I was just kind of, I, I know a lot of our listeners um, are recreational runners, but recreational runners who want to kind of perform and get the most out of them. A lot of people are, you know, striving for a Boston qualifier or striving to break for hours or whatever it may be, and they want to do anything that can give them the edge. So yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, I think gone, gone on the days where, um, I mean, if you look back 10 years ago, women were sort of avoiding fat at all costs and looking for low fat, whereas now uh, it's certainly not recommended that they do and, you know, a lot of women are seeking sort of some more uh, foods with good fats in mm-hmm. them um, and, and are not as so scared of them either. They're realising the benefits of it. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. And then um, I just wanted to mention, as you said this, um, when it comes to healthy eating, you said you enjoy healthy foods. Have you um, kind of noticed that, did you always like healthy food? Or I personally think that once you start eating it, you kind of start craving it. Once you get your diet to a point, you begin to want it more. So have you kind of found that or um, was that just Uh, always loved it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, my dad was a naturopath when I was a child, okay. so we were we uh, were brought up on fairly uh, a strict uh, diet. Um, but I guess that's really ingrained in me that that that's just sort of the health the healthy foods are what I choose. But one thing I do notice with myself is when I'm training for an event or you know my training load's quite high, I do crave and I generally eat better and in my periods of sort of recovery after a race or I have a break, just without even um, noticing or even trying, my diet tends to not be as good. So it, it seems to go hand in hand with the training, I think. It's just what you're reaching for when, you, when you're doing that heavy load. Mm-hmm. And have you found the other extreme that, uh, you know, you've, like you said, it you, it's important when you are training hard to get it right but what about um your thoughts I mean I personally am a big believer in after a big race or an important race you take that time away and you enjoy whatever the heck you want for a few weeks have you found that with as well 
Oh, yes, definitely. So I, I actually did my first Ironman late last year and mm-hmm. just coming off a break from that now, which which was nice because my break was over Christmas and New Year's, uh, mm-hmm. so that was perfect perfect timing. Uh, but, yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed some sleep-ins and probably consuming a little bit more champagne than I normally would and, yeah, just in, enjoying life a bit more, even though mm-hmm. I enjoy running, but, yeah, just being a bit more relaxed about things. No, I, I think that's something, to me personally, that's something very important. And uh, like uh, I mentioned, I, I've just been on my honeymoon and I, I gained 10 pounds in that time <laughs> um, over that last month of my honeymoon and Christmas. And, um, you know, it's hard not to panic about it. But at the same time, I think it is very important for women and men yeah. or anyone yeah. uh, after you've had that goal race where you've really you know dedicated yourself given that yourself the right food you've trained hard you've put your body in that state that you talked about uh, where you you know struggle to walk around that you take that time to like you said be a normal person who does you know stay out a bit later or yeah, um, have a few more glasses of champagne without thinking oh you know what if I yeah. feel bad on my run tomorrow yeah so. um and the other thing, on, I mean, I'm the same just coming off a recovery period is you, you do feel bad about it, and you, but I actually also enjoy the process of getting fit again. So, you know, it's, it's going to take two months but and it's a slow process, but, you know, watching your body change again and your fitness build back up and getting back to the times that you're running is, is, is an exciting process. And, you know, if you do the work, that will happen. So, um, yeah, it's all part of it. Definitely. I am so glad you mentioned that because that, I think is huge and something that we often forget about we look at ourselves at that point and say oh look what I've lost or you know I look at my arms and say oh where is all my definition gone but you like you said and my husband said it to me earlier like it's it's the starting point and Mm -hmm. you you know if you do take a picture of yourself at the beginning then you know at the at the time right now you might look at a picture of yourself after Christmas and think oh I don't even want to look at that but get yourself a picture (laughs) So when, you know, in two months time, like you said, when you have changed, you can actually look back and you can see a a big difference in how you've changed over that time. You can see the muscles poking through a little more. But like you said, along the journey, you can you can notice those little changes. And, you know, maybe you put on a pair of pants that don't don't fit you just right Mm -hmm. now and then they fit you better now. And so I think that's something that's very, very important to note it mention. And I didn't mention that. So um, I think that's very helpful for women. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just unfortunate for us that the the gains happen a lot slower than the the losses. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes, yeah. It's uh, it's very easy to fall off and kind of uh, struggle with it, but it's it's much more difficult to um, keep it going. And I think well, I think once you keep it going, it helps. But yeah, yeah like you definitely. said, you you notice it a lot more, especially within yourself. And of, unfortunately, as we all know, the images that are portrayed of women. Um, women in particular are usually airbrushed and it's hard to not strive for that comparison trap mm-hmm. once again. Um, yeah. And, Unless you know, you're reading Women's Running Australia because that's just designed to make everyone feel good about themselves. <laughs> that's good. Okay, well, people should definitely <laughs> check that out. And um, I, think it, I think this is really going to help a lot of people because I know it is something that women in particular do struggle with. And while we have this uh, episode and while I have you here and I know, like you mentioned, you're a fem- a feminist if you want to call yourself that um I just kind of like to talk about it just a little bit more for women who are listening right now I'm sure all the males have long checked out or if you haven't (laughs) then maybe this is an issue that um comes up for you and that's something we don't we you know does happen as well um but then okay so when it comes to um women and we were talking earlier about comparison do you find that um the comparison does happen more with the weight issue or is it more uh, performance based have you seen that through like comparing yourself to other women yeah i uh, i think a lot of women probably don't like to admit it but we do look at how other people look it's just Mm -hmm. how we are and i I mean, I think back to why I started running and one of the reasons is weight control because you like to um, keep slim. Uh, So, yeah, it is hard not to do that, uh, but we're all so different. Mm -hmm. I know, and it it is because you see, and I've mentioned this before, but I might as well say it again, I 
everyone thinks um, being an elite runner, I, I stand on the starting line and I'm so confident and I just, oh, I'm just king of the world. And you mentioned, you know, well, if I look like you, but in my opinion, um, I look at others and I think, oh, I wish I looked like that. And it's, mm. we're never going to be happy. The grass is always going to yeah. be greener on the other side. Um, and do you have any thoughts on how little ways of, uh, you know, someone looking at their body right now and thinking, learning to love it based on, have you found any little tips that other runners that you've talked to have recommended or just yourself? Mm, not really. I, I don't, you've kind of got me stumped there. I don't <laughs> really uh, have much advice in that area. Um yeah, no, I can't answer that one. Sorry, okay. Tina. Okay, well, the, I mean, I guess for me, the only thing I've kind of found that really helps is just kind of thinking about your strengths. Like, say you, you know, you feel that your arms are a little bigger. Well, you know, under those arms, maybe you've got more strength to pump those arms up a hill. Or mm -hmm. let's say uh, your tummy, you're a little more um, self-conscious about that okay, well, you can look at that and think, okay, well, that's very feminine. I've got my, my curves, which, you know, make me feel good about myself um, and make me feel more like a woman. Or maybe you've got a bit of a bigger butt and you can say, well, okay, well, that gives me big glutes, which is going to help mm -hmm. me to power myself to run faster. So I just find it's very good to kind of look at those, look at your body and, um, you know, think about how it's got its strengths. And um, I did a thing with a friend um, a few months ago where each day we would wake up and tell each other something that we uh, loved about our bodies. So each mm -hmm. morning, you know, I remember one she gave me an, as an example was the IT band. Like she loved being able to see her IT band kind of um, not, you know, sticking out, but she loved being able to kind of see the, the shape of it. Um, it's when she moved her legs in a certain way. So maybe if you are struggling with that right now, uh, maybe that's something you can try to... Um, yeah, definitely. With I like a friend. that idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. so... Um, okay, Sarah, well, um, I just have a few more questions, um, which I would like you to keep your answers short. Um, but if you could, this is the, I'm going to call it the race round for now, but we'll see if we come up with a different name. Sure. So sure. Um, just a few quick questions. Um, what is the mm -hmm. greatest advice you've ever received? Uh, slow down. Uh, okay. You don't have to do all your training so fast. Good. That's great. Um, yeah, your favorite down. running book or blog? And you're not allowed oh. to say women's running. Oh, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's the first thing that came to mind. We know uh, that. Definitely women's running Australia. <laughs> um, oh, I'm looking at my bookshop thinking what is my next one? Might have to come back to that one, Tina. Okay, I'll give you a second. Um, I, I think I already know the answer to this, but uh, what would you like to tell a new runner? Uh, yeah, have fun and enjoy the milestones and improvements. Okay, love that, love that. Your favourite running product? Um, it would have to be my running sticks. So running they're just sticks. a little. Yeah, so I know you wanted me to keep this short, but I might have to give oh, a little no, bit no, of Oh, no, 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 go into it. No problem. No. Uh, so they're little bits of plywood that I just carry in my hands, um, mm -hmm. and they were originally invented I guess you would say by Australian triathlete Peter Robinson and it's just to help me with my running technique so I tended to drop my hands down when I got fatigued um, and had threw one out, hand out to the side so it just helps me remind me of that and I've fixed the technique now but now I'm just addicted I don't really go for a run without them. And how long are they like are they pretty big or just no, keep it so in your hands so you feel something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're not light and I don't grip. They are light, sorry, and I don't grip onto them. They're just essentially sitting in my hands to make sure I don't let them drop down. Interesting. Okay, I'll put a link to those in the show notes as well. That I'm sure some other people are interested in that as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to look and see if I can find anything online because it was actually, um, yeah, a coach started me using them and now I've just continued to use them and most people hate them but I, I uh, yeah feel naked if I'm not running okay them. all right well if you if you can't find anything by the time this goes live then I guess our listeners can just go find a stick an actual <laughs> stick outside and just well, give that a try <laughs> I actually did that after a, a fun run a couple of weeks ago and I forgot them so I just went in and found a couple of twigs and used those <laughs> there you go okay that, then that's easy to do um and then yeah. who is your favorite expert to look to for advice 
Uh, I probably would have to say uh, my partner who's a triathlon coach and he's, yeah, we have a lot of, I guess you'd say, healthy discussions. But, yeah, I get a, I get a lot of advice from him, that's for sure. Okay, that's great. I'm sure he's going to love to hear that. And then have you come back to your running book or blog? No, I can't answer that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. We're just, we'll just we'll say that you're you're really just that passionate about women's running that there's just yeah, nothing else in your head. Yeah, there's just nothing else is good. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll allow you to take that. <laughs> All right. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate talking to you today. And I'm sure uh, our listeners have got a lot out of this. So thank you for your time. And I wish you the best of luck with what's coming in 2016. Yeah, thanks, um, Tina. It's been a pleasure. And if anyone does have uh, any questions about my research I'm always happy to answer them so feel free to put my uh, email address in the show notes okay I absolutely will all right thank you so much thanks bye I really enjoy talking about those kind of topics and I hope you do too I think Sarah had some great insights there and it was just kind of great to get a discussion going on the uh, comparison trap as I know so many of us fall into it and it just it can be so damaging to our confidence so hopefully you're able to take some insight from this episode if you did enjoy this podcast I would love if you could subscribe which you can do so um, in addition to checking out some other cool stuff by visiting the brand new podcast page that we have this year which is at runnersconnect.net forward slash run to the top or you can actually sign up to our email newsletter through any of the Runners Connect uh, web pages. You will be able to see the sign up on the side of the page or sometimes at the top of the page. So uh, that's all from me. Next week you are going to be hearing from uh, Patrick McCohen, who is a expert and um, he's going to be talking to us about breathing and how we can use that to improve our performance and just feel better in our lives. So hope you look forward to that. Have a great week.